Hello and welcome back to Everard Junction. In today's video I'm going to be working on this corner of the layout, working on a scenic break in the form of this farm bridge to try and sort of hide the transition of the layout between scenic and fiddle yard. This is part one of a two-part series where I focus on this corner. It's taken an awfully long time to build up the scenery to the stage you see in front of you, and that's what we'll be covering in today's video. In future, I'll be coming back and adding yet more detail and really bringing this corner of the layout to life. So let's hand over to myself about a month ago when I started this process. So today I'm going to work on the bit of scenery towards the end of the layout where we have this uh, field which is still very much under construction, still detail to add to that and I still need to complete that fence but you get the idea. So I've removed some sections of the road bridge that I had at the end of the layout here and I've also removed the backboard uh, just so it's easier to access and complete the scenery that we're going to do in this video. I'm going to use some of this brick plastic art to construct the end walls for supporting the bridge. These are made by Wills Kits and they come in a pack of four or five I believe, uh, part of their builder's range. Uh, relatively small but uh, you can glue them together and I've used them in various places on the layout as they go with the retaining walls. Uh, main reason for using them is you can see the, the varied appearance of the brick, how some of the bricks appear to be damaged and how some of them stick out slightly from the face of the wall. The wall is not uh, completely uniformly flat and it will just give this bridge a real aged look and it'll look like it's been there for a great many years. You could just perhaps uh, apply a mortar wash and some weathering to this stuff straight out of the box but for me it's a little bit too bright and orangey for what I'm trying to do so I'll paint the whole thing. So I've glued two of those Wills brick sheets together. You can get quite a nice join if you take a little bit of time. So join those two together and then give them a quick coat of this Expo dark grey primer. So we'll give this wall a coat of Humbrol 70, which is a relatively dark brick tone. Not too far away from burnt umber in all honesty, it's a little bit lighter than that. And I'm going for that darker colour as we're trying to portray some older aged brick. If I was doing perhaps a more modern structure then I'd use something like the uh, rail match light brick. So I've mixed up some paint ready to go into the airbrush. As I'm using enamel paint you've got to be particularly careful the uh, fumes are not very good for you so whenever I do any airbrushing I always make sure I use this uh, spray booth. It's a relatively cheap item you can get these on eBay and Amazon and various other places and I've had this one for a couple of years and whenever I'm doing any airbrushing I always make sure that we use the paint booth even if I'm using water-based paints. Okay, so I've left this to dry for a couple of hours. You don't have to worry about leaving stuff overnight sometimes. If it feels dry, then move to the next stage. You don't have to wait forever. So as you can see on the other one here, I've added uh, some weathering, some mortar washing and some graffiti. And it might be difficult to see on the camera, but hopefully you can see the, uh, the detail from the mortar washing. And some of the weathering as opposed to just the plain brick wall. So it really is one of the best things you can do to some embossed brick is a mortar wash and then if you're feeling a bit more adventurous you can do some graffiti and weathering a little bit like that. So doing a mortar wash on brick plastic card I've shown a couple of times but I'll show you again. It's very very simple. Uh, I like to mix up a colour and just put it in a spare pot. So this is a mix of various uh, beige colours and white until I get something resembling a sort of mortar type colour. And then I, uh, I put some thinner in there, make sure it's nice and thinned, and then we can just spread it around on this brickwork. So you can see that it's quite thin. I'll just dab it around like that. Don't have to go too crazy. Just make sure you've got a good coverage on the piece of plastic. So there we go, I've just painted the whole thing as you can see and the wash has got nicely into all of the detail in between the bricks 
and what we'll do is wait for that to dry. Uh, this is some Vallejo acrylic paint, that's this uh, mix, and as that's a water-based paint it won't take very long for it to dry, so I'll give that sort of 20 minutes, something like that, and then we can come back and we can use some thinner and we can remove the wash from the face of the bricks and that'll leave the mortar detail in between and it'll look like a proper brick wall. I've left the paint for about 15 minutes to dry so now I'll take one of these cotton buds or rather several, I always keep a box of these on hand and the acrylic thinners and we'll just uh, wipe away the excess from the face of the bricks just there. You could also use a paper towel to do this but I quite like uh, using these as you get a little bit more of a varied effect. So there we go, you can see the difference there after the excess has been wiped off. One of the best things you can do to some embossed brick work is a mortar wash like that. It really brings out the detail in the bricks and makes it look much more like a real building. So next I'll add some weathering to the brickwork and just give it a little bit of age. And mostly what I use for that is the Tamiya Weathering Master uh, set, which is basically a set of uh, weathering powders. It's just a little bit neat and a little bit neater and tidier to use than say a traditional pot of weathering powder. And I mostly use the uh, soot uh, color on the brickwork and you get some nice um, rain washing stains onto the brickwork and then I'll add a little bit of graffiti and put it onto the bridge and we'll move on to the next bit. So there we go, these weathering master sets are very easy to use, just literally wipe the, uh, the powder down the side of the model, only need a very small amount and you can see it creates quite a prominent effect, a little bit goes a very long way. So I could of course keep going with that, but for the purposes of a small uh, bridge support that'll do. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit of graffiti to that freehand with a small paintbrush and then that uh, can be cut to size and go back onto the layout.
Okay, so that'll do for putting it back onto the layout. I'll do a little bit more airbrushing and weathering to it once it's installed and set into the scenery. You can buy transfers for doing the graffiti, but sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to get them to adhere properly uh, with the carrier film and such not showing, as typically you're dealing with matte uh, painted surfaces. So I just like to paint the graffiti freehand with a small brush. Just use a decent small brush and you'll be surprised with what you can achieve. So I'll get these two glued on. I'll just use a bit of super glue for that. And the more I look at this section, the more I think a central support in brick between the two pairs of tracks would also look quite good and we can have a uh, plate girder bridge in two sections on either side. I've seen a few pictures of that type of thing and it looks quite effective. Okay so I've just super glued the walls into position and before we tidy up the ballast I'm going to install the central support for the bridge. I think I'm going to go with that. I think it'll be a nice little feature to the bridge and it's also going to help just obscure a little bit uh, for where the trains actually go because you're going to have a, a wall just there and it's just going to obstruct the view a little bit and help uh, create a bit more of a uh, realistic scenic break. So as I've said before to remove some ballast we can just spray a bit of water onto the area. Sometimes you can spray some hot water. Hot water uh, works even better at sort of melting the PVA glue. But I find if you just let some ordinary cold water soak in to the ballast, you'll be surprised how easily uh, you can remove it with a uh, craft knife and a screwdriver. So hopefully you were able to make that out with the ballast saturated and soft. I just cut around it with a Stanley knife. In this case, just is a neat rectangle. And then you can use an old screwdriver and just scrape off the excess down to the baseboard. And it's very, very easy to remove. And uh, you can use that process on any bit of ballasting that's been glued down with traditional white uh, PVA glue. And uh, there you go, easy as that. So I'm going to go ahead and cut a piece of timber that fits into this section with clearance for the trains on both sides and once I've got a suitable piece cut to size we can then clad that in the brick plasticard and paint it in a similar manner to how we've painted this stuff and then that's ready to accept a roadway but before I put the roadway on it I will reinstate the ballast and tidy up the track weathering and just finish up any loose ends. I've made sure it's the same width as the roadway that's going on top, so I'll go ahead and clad that in some of the Wills brick plasticard so it all looks uh, like it's made from the same stuff, and then we can uh, tidy up the ballasting. So I've just glued the centre brick section into position, and of course I've made sure there is adequate clearance on both sides so that trains can still run past. And I think that'll look just a little bit more interesting than just a straight span across these four tracks. So the next thing I'll do is add some ballast to the bare patches and just tidy up the ballasting in this area in general. And once that's complete, a little bit of track weathering just to blend those new pieces into the existing ballast. And then we can actually focus on putting the uh, bridge girder and roadway on top. So I'll just use a soft bristled brush just to get the ballast roughly where it needs to be. 
Once I finish that bit, I always find a bit of vibration really helps settle the ballast into the tracks and help get some of those loose stones off of the sleepers. So just take any random object, in this case just a plastic lid, and just tap the track like so. And the vibration that that causes will just help settle the stones a little bit better into the track than you could do with a brush. If there's any points in the area, such as we have here, just make sure they still work and that they're not fouled up by any of the stones. And then when you apply the glue, just be careful not to uh, gum up the, uh, the mechanism too badly uh, with excessive glue. And it's the usual process. For gluing it down, I've got a spray bottle here with some isopropyl alcohol, and I'm just gonna soak the area up and then uh, apply some watered down PVA glue, which I have here using a eyedropper or syringe if you prefer. So that's all the glue soaked in. I'll leave that for several hours, probably a couple of days to fully dry. In the meantime, I can start working on the uh, girder bridge itself. I've left the ballast for 24 hours to cure and it's now pretty much dried rock hard. So I'll go ahead and do some weathering on that. And I've also just scraped off any loose stones that might've been uh, in the way of the wheels for the trains and on tops of the sleepers. So I've just scraped those off and you can see there's a few marks here and there on the sleepers, but all of that doesn't really matter. I'll go over it with a little bit of weathering and it'll help blend some of this together. But mostly what I'm trying to seek on this layout is a sort of patchy finish with regards to the ballast. You can see all over the place in various areas on the layout that the ballast is made up of lots of different colors and sizes of stones and there's different amounts of weathering in different places and that all goes to make the the scene look that little bit more authentic in real life very rarely is the ballast completely uniform in color unless it's been freshly laid I've made sure to be careful of the points with regards to the gluing process and make sure I didn't get too much in the way so you can see the points still operate correctly so that's good. We just need to be careful now with the track weathering. If you're not uh, using a frog juicer or point motor with uh, the relevant outputs on it, and you're just relying on the point blades for contact for electricity, you need to make sure obviously you keep those clean. If you've got these all wired up for DCC, then it's not so much of a problem. But uh, as they're not wired up currently, I will make sure that I don't get paint down in this section here, as that's going to inhibit the ability for the trains to run over that section. So what I've done is just put a little bit of masking tape where the rails touch each other, and that should keep those clean. So what I'll do is I'll go over this lot with the airbrush, blend it all in and get it uh, to the standard that I'm looking for. And uh, then we can peel off that masking tape and just touch in any areas that look perhaps a little bit too pristine with a brush. So I've brought the airbrush up into the attic and we're now ready to uh, apply the weathering to all of this section and blend it in. Uh, for this I'm going to be using some acrylic paint from the rail match range and today I've chose frame dirt. I usually use sleeper grime but frame dirt is also quite a close colour and I do like to try and vary the tones and mix things up. As I've said previously, and also in other videos, try and work in a ventilated area when you're doing any airbrushing or spray painting. In this case, I'm a bit compromised because I'm in the attic. So what I tend to do is make sure everything's ready to go, do the painting, and then leave and let it dry. Don't come back up here, just give it a good couple of hours to flash off and let those fumes dissipate, and you'll feel a lot better for it. I'm also going to focus a little bit of the weathering 
around the brickwork. It'll help tone down some of that graffiti and also allude to uh, dirt being thrown uh, from the trains as they go past brake dust and things like that. The walls in this situation are very close to the running rails, so they will over time get a build up of dirt and grime on them. So again, we're gonna be careful, try and do a nice subtle effect, but it's important to at least put some airbrushed uh, finish on the base of those walls, similar to the surrounding track work. So I've blended in most of the brown tones, quite pleased with that. So the next thing to do just before we finish up and leave this to dry is to apply a little bit of black to the center of the tracks to help blend it into what I've done previously up in this section of the layout. So there we go, I shall leave that to dry. You can see how the paint has just blended some of the tones of ballast into what I've done previously on the rest of the layout here. And once it's all dried, it will look even better. And I've cleaned the uh, tops of the rails, etc. So we'll let that dry and come back and uh, finish up the last few bits. And with that finished, we'll take a Pico track rubber just clean the paint off the surface of the rails. I don't typically use a track rubber for actual track cleaning, but they do a nice job of removing the, uh, the paint residue and any glue residue that might have dried on the top of the rail. Obviously the rail needs to be clean and shiny so that it conducts electricity and the trains work properly. And of course, in real life, the top of the rail is always clean and shiny because it always has trains running over it. I've made a little bit more progress and what I've done is just glue down some 50 millimeter insulation board into the back of the layout just there and whilst that's dry we can uh, carve that into shape and sort of blend it into where the bridge is going to go. I just use Gorilla Glue to glue down the foam as it uh, seems to do quite a good job. Everything over here has now dried and I've made sure the track is clean and the trains still work and nothing uh, hits those uh, brick uh, walls that I've installed and there's plenty of clearance uh, for all the trains as they run through there. I do need to make a small alteration and that is to fit some cable troughing. I completely forgot about it so I just need to dig up a little bit of the ballast back there and just let this uh, section of cable troughing in. Here's what it looks like once it's installed. It's a kit from Scale Model Scenery, and I make sure that I have a representation of the cable troughing in various parts of the layout. And up on the main section here, I have a section of it running behind the far track just there. So I need to make sure that that continues down in this direction. And then that allows me to add things like relay boxes and other small details along the line side in future. The scale model scenery kit that creates the cable troughing is made of card, so obviously it does absorb some of the isopropyl alcohol and the glue, but I've not really had any issues um, with it becoming uh, saturated. Uh, it doesn't lose its shape, it seems to hold pretty firm. So that will dry rock hard and we can come back and put the lids on at a later date. So now it's time to construct the girders. You can see I've made the first one. 
They're going to be quite long and they're made using the Wills girder which is part of the Pico range. They come on a sprue and the pack is quite generous. You do get quite a few pieces in each pack. As you can see they're all constructed from the separate panels there and you can make them up to any length you want. It can be a bit fiddly so what I like to do to assemble them is to glue them onto a very thin sheet of plastic card. So you can see this white sheet that they are sitting on. That's a very very thin sheet of plastic card. You could use something thicker if you wanted to. Now glue each one in position and use a straight edge such as this steel rule to make sure they're all lined up and then you can flip it over and glue the girders or sections onto the other side which will create a nice girder like this with two sides. Once you've got those done you can just come along and glue along. You see the top riveted section just there and I also like to put a very small skim of filler on the joint and just blend it in so when it's all painted it looks nice and seamless just like the real thing. So I've just assembled the two girders, glued all the various parts together and then just sprayed that with some Expo Grey Primer. I'm going to leave these ones grey. I have a mixture of green and dark red girders on the layout but I don't actually have any grey ones and they're commonly seen in a sort of grey colour, various shades of course. So I'm going to leave them like this and we'll do some weathering and rusting to them. So first thing to do is to create some variation in colour. This is all a bit too uniform so we're going to put some faded patches of paint onto this before we actually add the weathering effects over the top of that just to give a sort of aged sun faded look. I like to use a sponge to do little effects like this as you avoid any brush strokes and it creates a random sort of effect which is what we're looking for. So the next thing I'm going to do is add some wash around the rivet detail and all the sort of tight corners of the girder and that will add some shadowing and some age and just make everything look a little bit older and more worn down. I like to use washes for that sort of thing, I do the same stuff on the rolling stock and I'm particularly fond of the Tamiya panel line uh, washes as they uh, very good quality, flow really nicely, last for ages, I've had this one for years and I've still barely used any of it. And uh, yeah, they just work really nicely. I've also used the Humbrol washes a lot in the past, but in my experience they tend to start to dry um, even with the lid uh, sealed and you might find um, bits in the wash, um, which is the pigment actually setting um, in the thinners. So I like to use the Tamiya ones just because they seem to be a bit better on the quality. And there you can see we've highlighted the edges of the panel with a slightly darker colour and it will just make the bridge look that little bit more convincing, a little bit more three dimensional. Obviously it takes a little while to dry but I'll go ahead and do the rest of the panels on these two girders. Okay, so that's the wash applied to both of the girders and I've also made sure to apply some of it to the uh, top uh, sections uh, to highlight all of the rivet detail. So you can see the varied colours there, the different shades of grey applied using the sponge to create a sort of random patinated effect and then the darker shadowed sections where the rivets are showing that little bit of build up of dirt and grime and some age. So I've just started to add some of those subtle rusting effects 
want to be fairly gentle with this particular girder. I'm not going for something that looks like it's on the scrap heap. But you know, hopefully you can see the, uh, the rust pitting in there. I like to use dark brown for this colour. In this case I've used Vallejo German Black Brown, which is a nice deep brown colour and is very good for representing long-term, well-established corrosion. So it's been a few hours and I've been messing around with these girders, adding a little bit more weathering and also adding various I-beams and other bits of plastic card to create some underside detail. Given its position on the layout there is a small chance you might actually be able to see some of this detail and while it's certainly not 100% accurate it's something there to at least try and represent a little bit of the structure that you would find on a bridge like this. So I've made some more progress since the last clip and you can see I've installed some more bits of the wall, some more of the uh, buttresses and end supports just to make everything sort of blend in and look a bit more convincing. And now we have a nice scenic break so that as the trains pass through it looks like they're actually going somewhere. So these are just made using the same pieces of plastic on from Wills just glued together and painted accordingly in the same manner as the rest of the bridge. I've added a couple of coping stones. So we've got some there on the wall and some here as well just to tie it in and then once that gets blended into the scenery that I do around the edge it should look nice and established. So I've done quite a bit of carving to the foam and glued a few more bits onto there as well and you can see how we've got a gentle slope in the terrain and hopefully you can just about make out the presence of the small lane or farm track that snakes off to the side. The idea is that I can put some trees and bushes on this section here and it will obscure the road disappearing into the back scene and it should look quite nice once it's all finished. Certainly better than just going in a dead straight line from the bridge and going straight into the back scene at this elevation here. It will be very obvious that the, the road just sort of terminates into the sky. So hopefully the S-curve for the road will look a bit better. I'll do a little bit more carving and just work on the shape of the hill but that's roughly what I'm looking for something relatively gentle that's clearly man-made when all of this earth was excavated and dug out to put the railway in. So there we go I've done a little bit more carving and just made the uh, slope a little bit smoother a little bit more progressive. So the next thing to do is to just go over that with some plaster bandage just so we've got a nice hard surface uh, to work on with regards to the scenery and then we can start doing some painting and putting the ground cover on. I'm going to be using some Woodland Scenics plaster cloth as I bought a big roll of this a couple of years ago and I've just got a plastic container just off the side of the camera uh, filled with a small amount of water and then I can just uh, soak the plaster cloth into this and place it straight on the scenery without making too much of a mess. Okay, so that plaster cloth has now dried and the next thing I'm going to do is just go over that with some of the trusty sculpt mould that I always like to use on scenes like this and that will just help blend some of the geometric shapes a little better into the flat parts of the scenery and also give a little bit more of a rough coverage which would be better suited for grass, trees and bushes.
Okay, so it's a little bit difficult to make out because everything is white, but once it's all painted, it will become clear. I'm just finishing off doing the sculpt mold and just smoothing some of the bits out, and you hopefully can see that I've carved the sort of farm track into position. I've left the back scene in place as the long-term goal is to replace this back scene, so I'm not that worried about any damage that might occur to it. So a little trick that I like to do with the sculptor mold while it's still wet and still drying is the same thing I did on the scrapyard, and that is to create tire tracks in the road, and it just makes things look that little bit more convincing, a little bit more authentic, and as we are going for a farm track, it's likely it's gonna be quite rutted and muddy in a few places. So I'm going to take this Oxford Diecast Land Rover and just run it through the lane a few times and that will create some nice ruts and tyre tracks in the sculpt mould which will then show up nicely once it's all painted. So there you can better see the tyre tracks, that should look quite good once it's painted and we can add a few bits of uh, varnish and lacquer in there as well to uh, create a few shiny sections to give the illusion of sort of wet mud or puddles. When you use a vehicle for this, just wash it under the tap. The plaster's still wet, won't cause any damage to that. So as you can see, I've added some more sculpt mold and we now have the roadway going right the way across the bridge and then obviously following onto the bit that I did previously. So this is now dried and it's ready for some paint and you can see that I've put some tire tracks into it on this side as well using the Land Rover and just washed it off afterwards, cleaned it up uh, so it can be used elsewhere on the layout. But it's really nice having a couple of tire tracks in there and it just makes the road look that little bit more interesting and certainly as we're trying to portray a bit more of a track or farm lane, it's the sort of thing you're going to see. I had a look at bridges of this style and they certainly seem to uh, have a thin layer of dirt placed over the steel deck and certainly as the decades pass more and more dirt, sand and gravel is going to get uh, washed or driven up onto the bridge itself and that's what I've sort of tried to do there. So we've got some tyre tracks on the bridge deck itself and at the edges what I'll do is sort of a little bit of grass or something like that, a bit of grass at either side and a little bit in the centre just trying to sort of portray the way these little farm bridges tend to look. Okay, so I've just quickly masked up anything that's going to be damaged or ruined by stray bits of paint. And we're just going to go over the sculpt mold with a base brown colour. In this case, I'm going to be using Vallejo Leather Brown, which is a colour I quite like using uh, for various bits of ground cover. Uh, I've also got various uh, darker and lighter shades. Again, don't be afraid to use different shades and different tones around the layout to create varied effects. But for this bit, we're going to use the leather brown and then we'll go over that with other colours in certain areas to create some highlights and areas of interest. I'm going to use the airbrush for the majority of this as the sculpt mold is a particularly absorbent surface and if you brush paint it, it uh, does use up an awful lot of paint. So in this case where I'm just using a small bottle like this, I'd like to try and make that last. So today I use the airbrush but sometimes brush painting also works well. It just depends on the, the situation and how much sculpt mold you need to cover. Okay, so I've just gone round all of that with the airbrush and I've just used a small paintbrush to just touch in the details and the corners where it's difficult to uh, get the airbrush in without causing a uh, load of overspray. So I'm going to go over this with a few more colours and just create a little bit more darkness and depth in the road so that it stands out a little from the base ground cover and once this has got trees and bushes and grass either side of it I think it'll look quite good. Okay, so the paint has now dried. Now it's time for my favourite part of this process, and that is to bring it to life with some greenery. So we're going to start off with the base ground cover, and then we'll move on to the static grass, and then finally bushes and trees. So first I'm just going to wet the area down with some 50-50 PVA glue and water, and that's going to be for the base ground cover, the uh, sort of soil 
so it'll be quite extensive in its coverage it will cover most of this but I will leave a few areas where it's perhaps a little bit bare and that will just allow some of these brown colors to show through and uh, sort of allude uh, to some darker soil or some muddy areas perhaps I've done it in a few places on the layout and it looks quite good so we'll do the same over here So I've applied the ground cover and saturated it with some isopropyl alcohol from a spray bottle and then applied some more of that PVA glue over the top to make sure that we definitely get all of that stuck down. You can see I've also applied some to the bridge. I've looked at a couple of photographs of these sorts of bridges and you get quite a lot of uh, natural build up at the edges and if it's lightly used, some even in the centre. So I've done a little bit of that and then also blended it in to the existing ground cover I have on this field section on this side of the layout. So as you've probably guessed it's time to leave that all to dry and I shall leave that overnight before coming back and applying some of the static grass in a few areas and then we can move on to the trees and bushes and that's when it will really spring to life. I just used my usual mix for the ground cover just here and that is a combination of Jarvis uh, earth blend Jarvis tend to sell their stuff in bags, so I tend to just empty it all out into a pot. But you can see the sort of varied brown texture for that. That's quite good for applying over the top. You can see little bits of it showing through there. And then we've got two Woodland Scenics products, and that is the fine turf and the blended turf, and they're both uh, earth or earth blend. And the earth blend has some slightly brighter colors in it. There's a few yellows and a few reds which allude to perhaps a couple of wild flowers, very small of course, and the earth blend is, that's where the earth uh, colour is all just the, the same tone. So using those in varying amounts is how I achieve the ground cover, and then of course once that is uh, got some static grass over the top of it, such as over here, you can see how the static grass really complements that sort of earthy looking colour and you can also see how some of the brown paint shows through so don't be afraid uh, to leave some of the painted sections showing it'll actually look better for it. So now it's time to apply some static grass. The grass I happen to use is from Model Scene. I've got quite a lot of it in stock and I like to try and use the same brand on the whole of the layout as it just sort of blends things together a little bit, especially as I have a habit of going back and ripping things up I did previously. So there's always a bit of blending in to do on this layout. So I like to stick with the Model Scene grass as I have quite a lot of it in stock. And today I'm gonna to be using the early summer and the late summer blends in both two millimeter and 4.5 millimeter lengths. And we're going to be applying that in a patchy finish to this hillside, as I've previously mentioned. There's gonna be numerous trees and bushes, so we don't want to completely cover the whole area with static grass. Okay, so that's a combination of two different colors and two different lengths of static grass applied to this area. I'm gonna tidy up the mess, do the same to this section in the background, and also the section on the other side of the bridge where the embankment slopes down to that field. And we'll come back once it's all cleaned up and dried. Okay, so I've just given the track a bit of a clean and we're just making sure everything still works properly. I'm going to leave it there and we'll take it over to part two in the next video as this one's getting quite lengthy. It's taking quite a while to put this together but I am quite pleased with the new scenic break that's starting to take shape here. 
since the last few clips I've added a little bit more paintwork to the coping stones, a little bit of weathering to some more parts of the bridge using the weathering powder and I've also added a figure to the bridge itself just to add a little bit of interest. It's a 3D printed figure, so you can see there's lots of detail to be seen on the figure, much better than the sort of traditional stuff that we've had for the last 20, 30 years. I think they work out something like £1.50, so I've, I've bought a few of those figures, I've bought about 20 or so, and you'll see them starting to appear in various places around the layout. They're made by Fine Scale Figures, and it was uh, Dean Park Station, uh, Dave's layout, where I saw those in action. They certainly look very effective. So you'll see them starting to appear in a few places and I thought it'd be nice to put a guy with a camera up on the bridge just here doing a little bit of railway photography. I've also done a little bit more work with the plastic card and added the last few of the buttresses and bits of brickwork to the top of the bridge just there. So the main structure of the bridge is now finished and we can go ahead now and start to add the trees and bushes and shrubs all around that section. So there you go, hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back as soon as I can with the next video, which will most likely be a layout update, as I've been working on a few other little bits and pieces in other places around the layout. I'll do as much work as I can on the scenery in this section over the next month or two, and you can look forward to a part two on this section where we'll start to add all those other details that I mentioned previously. So take care, and I'll be back as soon as I can, as always.